everyone. Welcome to the December 3rd edition of the Time Form US Pacecast. I'm David Aragon, and I'll be joined in just a second by my co-host, Craig Milkowski. Back from a bit of a hiatus this week, and we're going to take a look back at the major racing from this weekend at Del Mar, Churchill Downs, Aqueduct, and a race from Fairgrounds. There were some uh, Eclipse Award ramifications that were sort of being worked out this week, although I don't think we gained a whole lot of clarity from those races that did uh, have an impact on potential Eclipse Award winners. Uh, I think the races that we saw just possibly created some more confusion. Uh, We didn't do a show last week. We're not going to take a look back at the racing from uh, a week and a half ago because there just wasn't a whole lot of stakes action that went on uh, going back to the week prior to this. And there's a ton of racing to talk about this week. So we're just going to focus on this past week of racing. And uh, Craig, I'll welcome you in right now. How was your uh, Thanksgiving break? I was good. I actually spent it out in Las Vegas with the family, had a nice relaxing week, Uh, did take in a bit of racing. I wasn't able to watch Churchill there because I guess they're having some kind of signal dispute, but I did manage to watch the big races on my phone and just had a good time and ready to get back into it. Nice. Uh, I spent Thanksgiving at my dad's place in Pennsylvania. We did a a ton of cooking and uh, yeah, it was a nice time with, with family did take in a, bit, a little bit of racing, and there's actually a lot to talk about this week. A ton of stakes racing at Del Mar, and that's where we're going to begin things uh, with some grade one action there. Yesterday, actually, or two days ago, actually, on Sunday, they ran the grade one matriarch for the Phillies and Mares going the mile. And this is one of those races that had Eclipse Award ramifications as Got Stormy was making her bid to, I think, be in the mix for that discussion of the Eclipse Award for champion uh, female horse on the turf in the U.S. And she really does throw her hat into the ring by winning this race what'd you make of her performance uh i thought it was just you know another really solid effort from her it was it was a good effort she got a 122 time form us speed figure which is a little bit below what she's been running in some of her better races but i also think this is a distance that probably isn't her best uh she was able to beat this field at a mile and an eighth but i think a mile is probably her her best distance but as far as eclipse awards uh she certainly is right there with Uni. Uh, she ran second to her in the Breeders' Cup mile, obviously, so maybe that one has a slight edge. But I think if you look at the total record, she she's right there with her. She's won more big races than Uni has. Slight correction. This race actually is at a mile, so this this probably was her best oh. distance. <laughs> oh. Sorry, I don't know why I thought it was a mile and an eighth. Sorry about that. A little rusty <laughs> off the layoff. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I agree with you though. The mile is the best distance for her, and she ran well to win this race. Um, she maybe got a little bit lucky. Some might say because Daddy is a legend who was second here, had some trouble out of the gate, was probably a little farther back than they envisioned that she would be. She made a strong late run. I thought Mandy Franco gave her a good ride. And after had that trouble at the start, maybe it could have been closer if she had gotten a fair break. Uh, but got stormy, like you said, she delivered again. Uh, it's, I think, a close call between her and Uni. Going back before this race, I really thought it was uh, Uni's award, um, and now I think it's a little, it's a little tough to say because got stormy and, and her have very similar resumes. You could argue that got stormy has just done more because she's completed a longer campaign. Uh, so I think it's kind of a toss up. It's certainly how it feels for me. I've got to look at it a little bit more, but I'm not sure who I vote for at this point. Yeah, same for me. Uh, we'll have some time to study that and look at it in closer detail. But like you said, it was a good effort. Uh, I guess I was flashing back to the matriarch. Used to be run as long as a mile and a quarter. Then it cut back to a mile and an eighth. But it, it's been a mile for quite some time. So definitely uh, an error on my part there. Or we were just looking ahead to the next race we're going to talk about, the Hollywood Derby, which was a grade one at a mile and an eighth. Uh, that was for the three-year-olds on Saturday. And as we've talked about a whole bunch this year with these top-level races for the three-year-old turf horses, it's not the greatest crop in the world. None of them are running exceptional speed figures. Actually, this 118 that Mo Forza ran here is probably among the best that we've seen out of this group. Uh, he's just a horse that's gotten really good in the second half of the season, uh, went right from a maiden to a grade two victory. Now he's collected a grade one victory. Uh, He's really ascended to the top of the division, got a great trip in this race, and some others had some trips behind him, but uh, he's just in great form right now. He is. He's got that good tactical speed. He got a 118, as did the runner-up Neptune Storm, who was the uh, pace setter in here. And he set a solid pace, but not not a crazy fast pace by any means. There's no coded fractions in here and our past performances. And I just like what I saw visually from him. Uh, as you said, he did get a good trip, but he took full advantage. And horses with his kind of tactical speed tend to get good trips. And I think this one's got a pretty promising future. Uh, he, he's running 
improving, as you say. He seems to be getting faster every time, and that's what you need to do is we're into December now, and these guys aren't going to be able to run against only three-year-olds pretty soon. Now, we often see the East Coast horses dominate these races when they come over uh, to run in these West Coast grade one events. And that wasn't quite the case here. Standard Deviation and Digital Age, who both shipped over for Chad Brown, uh, finished third and fourth. I, got, I thought Standard Deviation got a great ride from John Velasquez coming up the rail to be third. Digital Age, not quite so lucky. He was sort of caught in behind horses at the quarter pole, had to swing very wide into the stretch. Ultimately, though, they probably had their chances and just weren't quite good enough. Uh, just not the greatest crop of horses, as we've talked about many times on this podcast. Yeah, I'd also add the, the Chad Brown shippers. It, it seemed like they had a little trouble handling the quicker pace. Uh, it, they definitely run the races at a quicker pace for the most part on turf in California, and they seem to be a bit farther back than they normally would be. Uh, the pace figures don't necessarily reflect it, but that's kind of how we equalize tracks. A, um, you know, we line up what the final time should be and the pace at a certain track. So when you ship across the country, you sometimes are running into different circumstances than you're used to. And don't get me wrong, Chad Brown shipped, shipped his horses west with plenty of success in the past. But it, it just seemed like this weekend his were shuffled a little bit too far back to, to be effective. Yeah, standard deviation is a horse that I would look forward to getting to go longer distances in the future. He's one that I could see being successful in some of those marathon races eventually, given his pedigree. The three-year-olds don't really get much of an opportunity to run in those races, uh, but I think next year as a four-year-old, he's one to look for there. Moving on to the older horses in the Grade Two Sea Biscuit later on that or earlier on that Saturday card, uh, we saw next shares. Got a great ride from Jose Valdivia coming up the inside to beat another Chad Brown horse, Sacred Life. Uh, you could argue again, Sacred Life may have been a little bit unlucky because kind of like Digital Age, he got held up in traffic briefly, had to make that last move, couldn't quite get there. But don't want to take anything away from next shares because he really ran his race and got back to form here. He did. Uh, I got to admit, I was totally baffled that this horse was 27 to 1. I mean, he basically had a, he had a terrible post in his Breeders' Cup race. Uh, he didn't run his race that day, but his races before that certainly seemed to make a, a contender here. And he's trained by Richard Baltus, who, who we're going to talk about again in another race coming up, who is just the best turf trainer there is out in Southern California, maybe along with Phil D'Amato, but... He's certainly right there. He's proven his horses can run with the best from the East. He shipped East and won a few races this year. So this one was definitely perplexing for me. Uh, he got a 120 time form U.S. speed figure, a uh, secret lay for 119. So, I, I mean, I don't think these horses are any world beaters. Uh, but, you know, it's a grade two, and that's about the kind of performance we got here. Yeah, next Sheriff was coming off a pretty bizarre performance in the Breeders' Cup where I know he was sort of a late um, addition to that race coming in off the also eligible list. And it just looked like he wasn't ready to run his race that day. He dropped like 20 lengths behind the field heading to the first turn, almost like one of those life at 10 situations where she wasn't going to participate. And uh, then he got back into the race very late. Uh, so that wasn't a true effort for him. And he got back into form here. Uh, he's a good horse. It's just... He can go off form and come back into form seemingly at random. He hadn't finished on the board since January. So this was a bit of a surprise, but I agree with you. This wasn't the toughest uh, grade two race that we've ever seen. And Sacred Life, he's OK, but I don't think he's really in the upper echelon of turf horses, even in Chad Brown's barn. So uh, we'll see how these horses progress. But there are better ones out there, I believe. Uh, sticking with Richard Baltus, as you mentioned, we'll move right on to his winner in the Hollywood Turf Cup, another grade two event from this past weekend. Uh, Oscar Dominguez, a horse that's sort of been right around uh, the victory at this level for a little while now. He's picked up some placings, finishing second, third and fourth recently. Uh, finally got the victory here. John Velasquez gave him a difference making ride because he saved a bit more ground than the horse that he just beat out to the wire United. And uh, I think that really was the deciding factor. Yeah, I would agree with you. That was the one note I made. Uh, United came out of, out of that basically shocking effort to run second in the Breeders' Cup turf uh, and cut back to three-year-olds and probably looked like he had this field over a barrel uh, based on the speed figure from that race. But the ground, the ground loss just cost him in here, and he wasn't able to uh, – to, I said three. He's These are older horses, obviously. Uh, but he wasn't able to uh, – 
to to overcome that ground loss. And Oscar Dominguez just got the better trip. As you said, it's Johnny Velasquez and a savvy rider who who worked out. And he was the difference. Uh, I will say once again, this is the Richard Baltus horse I was talking about. Uh, kind of amazing. He, he keeps paying prices uh, I think he's really a force to be reckoned with. And, and as California seems to be shifting to more and more turf racing, it does seem that their horses are getting to be a little more competitive than they were in years past with the East Coast horses as well. Yeah, I'd agree with that generally. Uh, we didn't have an, a top East Coast horse coming in for this race. And the speed figure is just, you know, it, it's OK for this level. These aren't really top level runners. I, I still think that's true. Uh, but United did run well in the Breeders' Cup and take a step backwards here. I looked up the track numbers that you were referencing. Uh, he actually traveled 32 more feet than winner Oscar Dominguez. He traveled 68 more feet than the third place finisher, Wharton Jerry, who we actually beat by just a head. So, I mean, the fact that he finished in a blanket finish with those two horses covering so much more ground. I think that's pretty significant. He was probably best in this race. Uh, it's just got to wonder a little bit about how strong that Breeders' Cup turf really was. Uh, no, take nothing away from Brixton Mortar. He's a deserving horse of the year candidate and all of that. But uh, I don't think we saw the, one of the top performances in the Breeders' Cup turf that we'll ever see. It was just the cap of a really consistent, uh, impressive campaign for Brixton Mortar. And that's why his Breeders' Cup win uh, was uh, really so uh, uh, conclusively made him the leading candidate for horse of the year. Uh, let's move on to the turf rate to the uh, two year old turf racing at Del Mar that we saw this past weekend. Uh, there was one for the Colts and Geldings and one for the Phillies. We'll begin with the female version, the Jimmy Durante, won by Alms for Mike Stidham. Uh, this filly is still undefeated after three starts. This was her first time stretching out in distance after winning the Matron, going six furlongs at Belmont last time. I know this was a filly that had been pre entered in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf. Uh, I think she had a slight setback and had to miss that race, but based on this performance, she might have. Been pretty tough in there yeah she's uh still undefeated after after three races now first time around two turns as you say and she ran her career best 103 time form u.s speed figure our previous best had been a 98 in her debut and, and i liked what i saw from her uh I think a lot of times people are, are of the mind to dismiss a horse because, you know, she's just a sprinter stretching out. But you got to remember with these two-year-olds, you're going to see that a lot more. And particularly as turf racing just get more and more popular, we're seeing more and more horses start out just sprinting on turf and working their way in the routes. And we're going to talk about that in the uh, Cecil B. DeMille as well. Uh, but a good effort. I don't remember off the top of my head what the speed figure was for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf, but it probably wasn't much faster than 103 she got here, and she really looked good doing it. Yeah, I want to say the winner of that race, Sharing, only got a 100 or a 101. So, I mean, it really puts her right in line with the winner of that race. And, I mean, Alms just traveled like a winner every step of the way. She was a little restless in the gate, was a little keyed early for Paco Lopez, but he settled her down, and she just – looked like she always had this field at her mercy and uh, she pulled away on the stretch. The disappointment in this race was the half sister to Lady Eli, Princessa Caroline, who could only manage to finish third. Starting to look like that 109 time formula speed figure that she earned in her debut might not be the truest number in the world. I know the buyer number came back very fast as well. We've seen now multiple horses come back out of that race and just badly disappoint. Uh, so I'm a little bit skeptical of that particular race, uh, but uh, she can obviously do better in the future. It was just her second start and her first against stakes company yeah i actually had a note to mention that figure that i that i'm a little skeptical of it as well uh, i'm a little leery to change figures for two-year-olds because a lot of times i'll see that they don't run right back to it and they'll they'll come back to it a little later but it's definitely one that's on the radar and, and worthy of following Moving on to those two-year-old Colts, we saw a smooth like straight uh, dominate on the front end of the Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, same conditions as the Philly race, grade three for the two-year-olds on the turf at Del Mar. And uh, really, it was just not a competitive pace situation. Uh, Giovanni Franco used him a little bit out of the gate to get that position on the lead, but he really slowed down the pace through the second quarter mile and especially around the far turn and the field just kind of bunched up behind him when it came time to kick home for the wire. He just had a ton left in the tank and uh, the closers really couldn't get into the race. It was his first time stretching out just like Alms and he was doing it off a maiden victory, but it didn't seem to matter. 
No, he came in with the best last race time for him, U.S. Speed figure. I think it was even our top power pick in the race, which doesn't happen often with 15 to 1 shots. But again, between his uh, tactical speed and being able to uh, stretch it out to a mile, he certainly was worth a bet in here, in my opinion. Uh, and, and he proved that the second term was no problem when, when he was able to get that clear, easy lead. Uh, he, he got a 102. I can't remember if I mentioned that. He matched matched his uh, win, effort from his maiden win, and he's a horse with a promising future on the turf. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, looking behind him, I didn't see a ton of excuses for that many horses. I mean, you could maybe say that Hit the Road, who closed from last place to be fourth, was compromised by the pace situation because it's so hard to close from that far behind in a field this large. Uh, but I don't know. The winner was pretty dominant, so I don't want to take anything away from him. Uh, he looked really good, and he might just be the best of this bunch. Let's talk about one of the races from Sunday at Del Mar. It was actually a maiden race that won one race before this Hustle beat DeMille, uh, going the six furlongs. Didn't look like a competitive race on paper with a one to five favorite in the mix, but that Philly, Sonny Dale, could only manage to finish second to Miss Stormy D, who uh, exploded with a 120 time form US speed figure. Want to get your take on this horse because this number kind of came out of nowhere, except for the fact that it was her first start on the dirt. Yeah, I, I have to be honest, this was not an easy figure to make. This was one of the day I actually did the California figures for this day. I usually don't, so I'm going to consult with my assistant and see what he thinks on it. But there is a fast group of maiden fillies out there in California right now. I went back and looked at Sunny Dale's last race where she had was the runner-up with a 110, and it's proven to be a very, very strong maiden race. Lots of winners coming out of that one, stepping up in class or horses breaking their maiden. So, I, I mean, it would have had to been a sheer guess to, to just knock this number down arbitrarily. And that's something I don't like to do. Uh, I went with the side that maybe this is a horse that just wanted dirt all along. And, and she really looked good running over it. The pace was solid. And, and I'm going to be willing to bet these horses off these numbers where they show up. But again, it is one I will have on my radar to kind of track and, and make sure it lines up with with what we see now in the chart. Yeah, it's funny. I was watching that race live. And when this horse beat the favorite, it was kind of one of those things where you say to yourself, well, we'll see how fast the track is playing. But either this horse that won the race ran just a gigantic figure or the second place finisher really regressed. And uh, it seems like maybe the, that that didn't happen. And uh, I think it's a valid possibility that Miss Stormy D ran this fast because we've seen horses switch surfaces and just explode with these top figures in the past. It's not like she has some big turf pedigree. So they might have just gotten, you know, pigeonholed her into being a turf horse when that wasn't what she wanted to do so interesting to see where she comes next let's move on to churchill downs to talk about some of the graded stakes racing that took place there and there was plenty of it uh older horses turf racing and two-year-olds uh we'll begin with the grade one clark handicap that they ran on friday and tom Ta, he was the favorite coming in and he delivered another solid effort it remains to be seen if he can really continue to progress to be one of the top handicap horses in the country because he's always kind of hovered around that that grade two grade three level in the past despite having run some very fast speed figures uh but reportedly they're keeping him in training next year so he's gonna go on and potentially go on to some better things next year in 2020 yeah, I was actually surprised watching this race. Uh, granted, I watched it on my phone, so I didn't have the best picture. But when I watched it, I thought, oh, that's going to be a really big speed figure, just with the ease of victory in the margin. But he only got a 123. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. And he was geared down a little bit, but I, I watched the replay just to be sure. I don't think he was geared down to the point where it really affected his speed figure other than maybe a point or two. And, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what to make of him. Uh, he seems like when he steps up in the grade one company and tries uh, better horses, he hasn't been able to produce uh, in the past. But I'm not sure what else is left out there right now. And I'm really curious to see where he shows up and who he'd have to face because he's as fast as anybody I can think of off the top of my head outside of the, the Breeders' Cup Classic that we saw. And even that wasn't the, the greatest race. Uh, it certainly wasn't one of the best Breeders' Cup Classics we're going to see. So he's an interesting horse. And I, I read they're not sure where they're going to point him yet if he's a horse that would show up in the Pegasus. Or, you know, maybe you want to ship over to Dubai. I, I just don't know. But he certainly has talent and he's still, uh, you know, he's a horse who maybe he could turn the corner and, and jump to the top of the division. Yeah, I remember having the same conversation with you around this time last year when we started doing these podcasts uh, about uh, horses that were going on to compete next year in this handicap division. And 
Uh, back last January, it seemed like a pretty weak group, and I think it kind of played out that way this year where there just was no clear division leader for a long time until Vino Rosso finally emerged late in the year, but now he's gone off to stud. Uh, so it's kind of wide open once again. And then Tom Stata, he's running speed figures right now that make him just as fast as everybody else that's out there. So he certainly could step up to be that kind of dominant grade one horse with just a slight step forward. Uh, we'll see if that happens, but we're going to talk about another horse in a little bit that ran at Aqueduct this week that could also be in that conversation. Uh, but I agree. Uh, Tom Stata, he's a lightly raced horse who's seven years old now, so we'll see if he can continue progressing. Uh, I just want to quickly mention before we move on, um, Owendale was second in this race. He's going to be four years old next year. This was his final start as a three-year-old. Didn't think Owendale got the, the best... Um, I don't want to blame the ride because it just seemed like it, he got shuffled back early, or I don't know if this was really a plan. It was just kind of um, a confluence of events that caused him to be so far back in this race. But I don't think he's a horse that really wants to be rallying from 11th place in a field like this. And he actually did well to get up for second because the early pace was not that fast. Uh, so he's one that I would look forward to moving on to be a four-year-old next year. Yeah, I definitely thought he ran well. Uh, given the trip that he had, uh, he showed some gameness to come through on the rail to get second late and he's definitely one to watch i assume he'll he'll be coming back next year and he's shown plenty of talent as a three-year-old so i look forward to his four-year-old year and you know just one last note about tom Zeta. i i he's a horse i'd like to see you know jump up to the top and run well but the speed figures just don't point in that direction like you said he's a seven-year-old so He's one to follow, but if I had to guess, I'd probably be against him when he jumps up against better competition again. Yeah, I, I, I can't disagree with that assessment based on the trajectory we've seen from him already. He's been good for a long time, and it's just kind of plateaued at that level. Uh, moving on to some of the turf racing we saw from last week at Churchill Downs, the three-year-old Phillies were in action in the grade two Mrs. Revere. Uh, the big favorite coming in for Chad Brown was uh, that gray filly uh, whose name is escaping me now, um, uh, new and improved. Uh, but it was his second stringer, Nay Lady Nay, who actually got the victory here. I think we do have to discuss the condition of the Churchill Downs turf course in relation to some of these turf stakes we saw, uh, because it seemed like it had taken a lot of rain and a lot of horses just didn't appear to be handling the course. Uh, one who had no trouble with it, obviously, was Nay Lady Nay, who came through under a good ride from Junior Alvarado to get the job done here. Yes, yeah, she got a nice 116 time form U.S. speed figure, which was her career best so far. But... I'm with you. I think it was probably largely in, in part, it was in large part due to the condition of the turf course. Uh, I don't know what the number is on our one to 10 scale, but I'm sure it's going to be a pretty low one. The times were, were definitely fairly slow. And, you know, I'd be a bit skeptical about this one, uh, unless she caught another course similar to this. Uh, she wasn't a horse who was campaigned very ambitiously by Chad Brown. She just kind of took a, uh, took advantage of a weak spot here and, you know, good win, but not a race I'm, I'm just going to be overly excited about. Yeah, she's one that I, I think might have surprised the barn a little bit because they targeted her at some of those mammoth races over the summer. Like they perhaps didn't think a whole lot of her, uh, but she did really improve at the end of this season. Her win at Parks last time was actually a lot stronger than the speed figure might indicate. I thought she was very visually impressive that day. And I mean, not that I'm redboarding this opinion because I didn't necessarily like her in this race, uh, but uh, she, she ran pretty well to win this this spot. Uh, but the turf course, I mean, it, it kind of it makes you not know what to make of it. I think the number that that's in the PPs is a three on the one to 10 scale. So it was definitely on the yielding side of things. And I think it's interesting to note, uh, we always talk about horses with the European pedigrees being more predisposed to handling these softer turf courses. And the three horses that were not bred in the United States actually completed the trifecta here. So that's just a little bit interesting to look at. Uh, but yeah, it's a race that it's hard to know what to make of because I wouldn't totally also write off new and improve the two to one favorite based off this one effort because it just seemed like she didn't really handle the course. Let's move on to the grade two fall city, staying with the Phillies and mares. This one was on the dirt on the Thanksgiving Thursday card at Churchill Downs going a mile and an eighth. And um, kind of like the Clark handicap, these are probably not the top handicap horses out there uh, in the Philly division, but my lady Curlin, she's just been a pretty solid grade two, grade three performer throughout the year. And I think she just caught the right field here and ran one of her typical speed figures in the low, you know, 110, 111, 112 range. 
Yeah, this is a weak grade two for older fillies and mares. She ran a 111 here, but she won easily. And the fact that she could run a 111 and win by over two lengths kind of shows you that the field wasn't really that strong. I think one of the horses that looked like her strongest competition on paper, uh, Sally's Curlin, didn't really show up for whatever reason, didn't run her race at all. So, you know, I'm not going to get overly excited. Go Google yourself, ran her typical race. Uh, she's always right up near the lead. Runs right in that 110 range, and basically nobody else showed up. It it wasn't a strong field on paper coming in, and that's the same way it looks going out. Also on that Thursday card was the grade three cardinal for the Phillies and Mares, the older ones, on the turf going a mile and an eighth. And uh, Calio, uh, minor upset in this race. She gets the job done coming from well off the pace. Uh, this was one of those situations where you kind of got a sense of how slow the turf course really was playing because it looked like uh, the horse that was on the lead with uh, a significant advantage, Lamari, through the early stages, was setting fractions that didn't appear to be that fast. But boy, this race just fell apart in the late stages as they, as they walked home. And it was the horse that just seemed to handle the course the best, Calio, that got the job done. Yeah, she did. She got a 117 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, she was one of two in here that had hit the 120 mark in the past, along with the heavy favorite Starship Jubilee. But I think she just handled the ground a little better than that one did. And uh, Starship Jubilee definitely regressed, even though she ran second. She only got a 114 time form U.S. speed figure in here. So she's had a long campaign. Maybe it took a toll, but but I tend to think it was probably the the condition of the turf course had held her back more than anything else. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that because I just never know how much stock I want to put in these races that are run over these late season turf courses because it seems like the form just isn't always duplicated when they run back on firm turf courses at other points in the year. Let's move on to the final two races we'll talk about from Churchill Downs this past weekend, both two-year-old events, uh, one of which I mentioned early in the show might have had some Eclipse Award, ram- Eclipse Award ramifications, uh, but turns out, Probably not going to be the case, as Tis the Law, who had a chance to clinch the title as champion two-year-old in this race. I imagine he would have been a pretty clear-cut choice if he had won this Kentucky Jockey Club. Uh, That was not to be, as the trip uh, just didn't quite work out for him. Also, maybe he just wasn't quite good enough because he had his chance in the stretch and just couldn't quite get by Silver Prospector, uh, who won this race for Steve Asmussen, who actually swept both of these two-year-old stakes races on Saturday. Silver Prospector is one that we've talked about in the past because he actually ran a very fast speed figure when he broke his maiden, and he proved here he can handle the extra distance as well yeah he ran pretty well he got a 103 i think he got a nice trip sitting off the slow pace uh he didn't get bottled up inside like tis the law but i'm with i'm kind of with you i think if i'm reading how you said it right i i wasn't impressed at all with uh tis the law i i don't think he had an ideal trip he, he it's a jockey wasn't very aggressive he kind of got him bottled up but that said he had every chance in the stretch to to make his run and he wasn't able to do it he was out finished by by horses who actually came from a little bit behind him so i think it was a very disappointing effort by him and what wasn't a particularly strong race yeah i think what i'm trying to say with tis the law is he probably should have won this race and what didn't allow him to win was the ride and the tactics, whether Manny Franco was under instructions to rate him or not. I don't know what the story is there. He obviously possessed the speed to be in front of this field early, given how slowly they went on the front end, but that was just not the decision that was made. And he also stumbled a bit out of the gate. I don't think that mattered that much because he recovered very quickly. Uh, but you just don't want to put a, a big favorite like this in a spot where he can get into trouble in such a compact field when the pace is slow, because it's just, you've got to get lucky to win or it doesn't always work out. In the stretch, however, he had his chance, and if he was really a deserving two-year-old champion, he was supposed to close the door on this field and win anyway, and he just wasn't able to do it. So, I mean, I guess he should have eked out a victory, but that probably isn't good enough. So maybe he's just not as good over a sloppy track as we expected he would be, or uh, maybe he just didn't handle the two turns. You don't really know. Um, But uh, he's one that I wouldn't give up on. It's just he, he um, he didn't walk through that door of opportunity that was open to him. Uh, And also, how strong was this race really? Because we can transition right into the Philly version of this race, the Golden Rod, where Finite actually earned a time formula speed figure that was one point higher. She ran a slower final time, but the pace was faster, and that's what made the difference there. Finite's just gotten pretty good at the end of this season for Steve Asperson. 
Yeah, and when you say slower final time, I think it was only 500, so they were yeah. pretty close. Uh, I do tend to think the Colts were maybe affected a little bit by the slow pace, might have held them back, but it wasn't a just crazy slow pace that we have everything coated in blue, so I'm not sure what to make of it. That said, I, I thought Finite ran well. Uh, she showed a little bit of a new dimension going this long, being able to come from off the pace as uh, she sat in third was able to close the gap uh, and make up the gap and go on the win. She got a 104 time form US speed figure, the same she had gotten her prior race where she won by, I think, six lengths. Uh, my only real question with her is, is maybe this is about as far as she wants to go. Uh, generally, with two-year-olds, you like to see those speed figures getting bigger as the distances go out if the – the horses were indeed want to go that farther. Uh, she's out of, she's by money. So I'm not sure she's a horse that, you know, I wouldn't be looking at her as a future Oak source or anything like that, but she's a solid enough two year old Philly. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, it remains to be seen how far she wants to go. I, I was impressed with her in the stretch of this race because a, a rival came to her and looked like she might just be able to roll by her and find out really dug in and turned her away and actually opened up a bit at, again at the end impressively. So, I mean, she's got all the qualities you want to see in a racehorse at this point in their careers. We'll see if she's truly a Kentucky Oaks type of filly. Uh, but right now, I mean, she's very nearly as good as anything else that's out there because it's not like the fillies that we saw in the Breeders' Cup were running that much faster than what she got in this race. Uh, so I think she's uh, among the best that we've seen um i do just want to mention her victory here and uh just her exploits since the summer at saratoga really do flatter uh the horse that beat her second time out mrs danvers and also who she photoed with in her debut for a second uh mrs danvers being a filly that was pointing to the frisette for shook mcgahee off her impressive maiden win at saratoga had a slight setback has been sent to the sidelines i know i read a while ago she's supposed to resurface this winter at Gulfstream, so uh we'll see when she comes back but she was one that i know a lot of people were very excited about and uh uh, Finite has just done nothing but uh, suggest that she might be every good, bit as good as we thought uh, since uh, uh, since the summertime. Let's head over to Aqueduct to discuss the stakes racing that took place there. And we're going to begin with what I thought was one of the most impressive performances of this past weekend in the grade three discovery where the three-year-old performer for the Phipses and the aforementioned Shug McGahey uh, stepped forward in his stakes debut to beat a really solid rival in Tax, uh, the Jim Dandy winner from earlier in the year. Tax coming back off a brief layoff here. And I thought Tax really ran his race. He got a good trip. The pace was honest. Tax moved into it at the right time. He had his chance to win. And Performer just turned him back, stretching out to two turns for the first time. He showed no signs of stopping at the end. I think this is a horse we can be pretty excited about. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, he ran a really good time for U.S. Speed, speed figure of 129. Uh, that was boosted a little bit because of the pace by a couple points. I had 127 final time. But, I mean, this horse was up there. He wasn't alone. He, he was battling with another horse. The The pace figures are fast. There was a 141 quarter, uh, like a 140 half mile, I think it was. So it was not an easy trip. And he still had plenty left to hold off tax. So you said had a decent trip in here. Um, he kind of backed off. Uh, I really like the ride by jo Joel Rosario in here. Uh, he determined that he was going to get good early position, and he hustled the horse out of the gate. And it proved to be a winning tactic, and he had the horse to back it up. And this is about as, as, uh, as an exciting a horse as I can think of heading into 2020. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, he was two to one coming into this race against Tax, who had run some speed figures that were just vastly superior to anything that Performer had run previously. But Performer kind of had that profile of a horse that you knew we hadn't seen the best of yet, given the fact that he's so lightly raced, given the fact that he's trained by Shug McGahee, given his pedigree. I mean, he, he's by Spitestown, over, uh, who's a speed influence over a really stamina-oriented female family, uh, deriving back to personal ensign uh, out of an AP Indy dam. Uh, so Performer really has all the tools to go on and be a nice horse. And I like to hear that Shug McGahee is sort of resisting that temptation to target some of these gigantic purse races like like the Pegasus, like the Saudi or the Dubai World Cup to instead focus on the major racing in New York. He, he mentioned the Carter and the Met Mile as early season goals for next year for Performer. Uh, and I just liked that path, uh, the fact that he's allowed this horse to progress through distances this year and he's going to do the same next year. I, I just think that's a really, it's a smart way to handle the horse like this. And I'm looking forward to what he does in 2020. 
I am as well, and no knock on tax at all. He was a horse who, if something came up, he had to scratch out of the uh, Oklahoma Derby. But he came back in fine form, and he's another one I look forward to seeing next year as well. One race after the Discovery, they ran the Grade 3 Long Island Stakes, uh, going a mile and three-eighths on the turf course at Aqueduct for the Phillies and Mares. One thing to mention about the Aqueduct turf course is that uh, kind of reared its head again this weekend is they took the rails down on Saturday on the inner turf course. So the rail was at zero feet. And we talked about this earlier in the meet. When they've done that at Aqueduct, it's, the rail has just become the place to be. And that was definitely the case once again on Saturday. And uh, no surprise, the rider that took advantage of it was Joel Rosario, who just seems to be he just seems to live down there on the rail at these turf courses. And I mean, it's amazing that it opened up for him. Coming around the far turn, it seemed like CKS Buena, the winner who he was riding, was in no position to win the race. But you look down at your program, you see that Joel Rosario is riding, you think to yourself, he's just going to find a way, isn't he? And that's what he did with this horse. Yeah, it was interesting watching this race on the replay. I think he actually went over into the chute a little bit. And if he'd have kept running straight, he'd have run right through the rail. So he kind of made room for himself, almost forced him his way through. Not, not a dangerous situation or anything like that. He just... Kind of got the horse to do what he wanted her to do and what he wanted him to do. And uh, she was able to get through and sneak in. Uh, she got a 112 time form U.S. speed figure. So not the strongest grade three by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the fact that a horse like her was six to five in here kind of tells you it was a weak field. But again, for me, the highlight was the ride of Joel Rosario. I thought it was uh, just incredible, to be honest. Yeah, and just, just to say, I mean, Joel Rosario is not going to win an Eclipse Award this year. He's probably not going to win an Eclipse Award in most years because he doesn't um, he doesn't ride enough winners to, to be kind of in that category with the Ortiz brothers. But I think if you compiled a list of anybody's top 10 or top 20 rides from the year, I'd imagine that Joel Rosario would occupy a lot of those positions in the major stakes races because, I mean, he, he's just given some amazing rides this year from, from Sir Winston's Belmont Stakes to races like this to just a whole slew of turf races that I'm failing to mentioned right now uh it's been quite a year for him from from a riding perspective in these stakes races across the country um and he made the difference here because the runner-up my sister nat uh she might have run the better race because she had to swing much wider was closing from a similar position but jose ortiz had to kind of lose ground coming around horses at the top of the stretch and she only lost the race by a neck all of that said, getting back to what you mentioned about the speed figure, it's not the strongest race. You see the top eight finishers were separated by a length and a quarter. That usually indicates this was not the best race in the world. Let's head on to another turf race that they ran on Saturday at Aqueduct. This one going six furlongs, the Aqueduct Turf Sprint, uh, where fully vested, uh, coming off a loss to Shecky Shabazz and his stablemate uh, Final Frontier in a race at Belmont. Got a bit of class relief here, not facing the top sprinters in the country. And uh, I think it was a combination of two things. He's just being a horse that's getting into very good form right now. And also this was a race where some others just didn't really show up with anything near their best efforts. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to look at our chart and see the speed figure. Where he ran third last time with a 117, and here he ran the same number, and he won by over seven lengths. So it's definitely a combination, as you say. He ran well, but there wasn't much in here. Uh, Gucci's a horse I would have maybe thought could have gave him a run for his money, but he appears to be heading off form, and nobody else really ran very well. So that, that tends to be how you get big margins one horse runs well and the others just don't show up. So uh, I think the margin's probably a little overstated. The 117 is probably a pretty good reflection of, of what kind of horse he is. And that's how I'll bet him going forward. Yeah, it was a good turf course at Aqueduct with a six rating in our PPs on a one to 10 scale. So uh, it, it was one of those like good to yielding courses that, that really wasn't quite anywhere near firm. And, and that can create some larger gaps between horses. So I think that might account for uh, the fact that some others didn't show up and that there was such a large margin of victory. But I don't think you could have made the figure much faster because early in the day we saw Mo Maverick, who was competing for a $40,000 claiming tag against New York Breds, uh, run basically identical early fractions and a faster final time. And he got a 120 speed figure. He, of course, was first off the claim for Jason Service. So it's not a major surprise that he improved like that. Uh, but I think it just calls into question how strong this uh, Aqueduct Turf Sprint really was. Yeah, that was some effort by Mo Maverick. I saw you tweet beforehand how strong uh, Jason Service is in situations like that. And he certainly backed it up. And he's actually one that should probably be making the jump to stakes competition next based on that number. 
No, he looks a lot like that Jason Service horse, Shecky Shabazz, who he claimed out of a claiming race at Saratoga and went right on to win some stakes races. I, I'd imagine they could take Mo Maverick to Gulfstream and do some damage in turf sprints there over the winter against Open Company, but we'll see what they ultimately do with him. Uh, wrapping up some of the uh, stakes action from Aqueduct uh, in the Cumley on uh Friday. Was that Friday? I think that was Friday. Uh, we saw Bolera uh, win for Todd Pletcher uh, going the mile and eighth distance. And I think the distance really had a whole lot to do with this result here uh, because she got it. And I think some others just maybe didn't particularly gold standard for Brad Cox, who just got a little tired at the end. Ari Fauna was um, the favorite in this race. She made a good run at the end, but she's one of these horses that took a lot of money based on the fact that she was an undefeated horse coming into this race, not necessarily because she had run the fastest speed figures. And she just kind of repeated the figures that she's able to run, and it wasn't quite good enough. Yeah, she's a horse that's been mostly running in Maryland. I do think she, she won an allowance race at Saratoga, if I remember uh, and she had a big reputation, but she had never really run that fast, as you mentioned. So sometimes these horses do have more in the tank and sometimes they don't. But I think at a short price like she was here, you want to bet that they don't. And that's how it turned out. Uh, decent effort by Bolera. She got a 110 for the win. It was a 108 for Arafana. Uh, solid group of three-year-olds, but again, nothing to get overly excited about. But Blair is one who I think might be able to handle a little more distance if she stretched out some and just be interesting to see where she shows up. As we said, these three-year-olds, they're running out of time to run against their own age division. So they have to step up pretty soon. Uh, and so it's going to either be Im- improve or, or don't. Uh, we'll see what happens with these. Speaking of those restricted three-year-old races, we saw another one of those uh, later in the card on Friday at Aqueduct on the turf. Uh, the Gio Ponte stakes for the three-year-old males going a mile and a sixteenth, and uh, was an exciting fight to the finish between two Mike Maker runners. Uh, the bigger price actually was the winner of this race by a, a scant nose. Uh, Temple held on here. Just a runner that that Mike Maker claimed uh, tried some tough stakes uh, pretty soon after that, and uh, he's just really improved for Maker off the claim, which is really not that surprising. He does that quite a bit. Uh, I thought Kadar, who was second here, actually ran very well because he made a big late run from the back of the pack in a race that didn't feature uh, that much pace. Uh, But uh, I hope they both ran really well. Yeah, they they did. He got your typical 115 for a three-year-old turf router. I was hoping to see some more improvement later in the year, but we didn't really get it. But as you say, these Mike Maker horses that he claims are just always dangerous in these races. Uh, It did take this one a couple starts. Uh, This was his third race in the Mike Maker barn. But anytime he claims a horse and starts running them in these turf stakes, they're worth following. Yeah, the really puzzling effort here was that as a third-place finisher, Halliday, who Looked like one of the speeds on paper. I mean, the pace projector had him right up on the pace uh, in the preliminaries. But um, for whatever reason, they took this horse to the back of the pack. He had a bit of trouble at the start, but they weren't aggressive after that. And uh, it just didn't work out for him, unsurprisingly. Um, Temple, who looked like a horse that would be coming from a little farther off the pace, actually got that trip that Halliday probably would have wanted to get. And uh, Halliday still ran well to be third here. I just don't think the trip worked out for him, uh, given the way he prefers to run. We'll talk about one more race before wrapping things up, heading to Fairgrounds for their Thanksgiving Day feature, the Thanksgiving Classic. I believe this was actually opening day at the Fairgrounds for their winter meet. And uh, this was, I think, tied with Performer for the biggest Time Formula speed figure of the weekend as Bobby's Wicked One, a horse that we saw do some very nice things earlier this year, uh, had gone off form, missed some time over the summer, but seems like he's really gotten back on track in a big way based on this performance. Yeah, he got a big 129 here. Now, granted, it was only a three-horse field, uh, so it's hard to take a lot more from that race other than he's back in form and that he ran a fast race. Uh, You know, he had come back from a layoff. He didn't run particularly well. Uh, He ran second. Uh, No, he ran well off the board after having a little trouble at the start. But, you know, he's back. He he ran a 130. I think it was in the Churchill Downs handicap when he was second to Matoli. So it's the 129 is not unprecedented for him. And, and he had run a fast race before that one as well. So I expect big things from this guy. I assume he'll probably run at the fairgrounds another time or two or maybe even at Oakland before trying to show up at Churchill again on Derby Day. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, he's one of these horses that I think just might be one of those need the lead types because he runs really well when he can be up close, either on a clear lead or contesting the pace as he was in that in that start against Mitoli back in May. Uh, and he's just not the same horse when he doesn't get the early lead, as we saw a couple times um, over the summer and then when he returned this fall. But uh, he got the lead in the three horse field here, and it really made the difference as he ran one of the best races of his career. And I agree with you since he missed so much time, um, whether it was by design or not. Uh, they can probably run in some of these races over the winter, and I imagine he'll be pretty tough if he continues to run as well as he did here. Well, that's all the racing for this week. We've got another big week of stakes racing coming up uh, this Saturday. It's the Cigar Mile Day card at Aqueduct. Well, they'll be running the Rems and the Demoiselle, uh, this Cigar Mile. I think one other stakes that I'm forgetting now, uh, but uh, we should talk about all of that. Oh, I believe the Fall Highway they rescheduled again for next week. Uh, so it should be a good card of racing that day. And we'll obviously handicap those races on the Time Form US forecast, which we'll resume again this Friday. And we'll recap them again next week. So, Craig, good to talk about these races. Good be back from a slight break. As always, you can listen to the Time Form US Pacecast and the Time Form US Forecast on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcast, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Wherever you get your podcast, just subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel and check us out. Thanks for listening this week, and we'll be back again on Friday.